Let's bow our heads for a moment. Lord, as we open your word together now, we pray that you would bless us with lessons from your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so I think I've got to do something different here. Sorry. Should work. All right, that's not good. Oh, okay, I, I just figured it out. <laughs> Technology. There we go. That's what I'm supposed to be seeing. What you're supposed to be seeing as well. Um, there, there's a hymn that's not in the current hymnal, but it was in the old Adventist hymnal. Uh, it was number 634, but that probably doesn't mean anything to you. Uh, One thing I of the Lord desire, for all my ways have miry been, be it by water or by fire, oh, make me clean, oh, make me clean. So wash me thou without within, or purge with fire if that must be. No matter how, if only sin, die out in me, die out in me. And, and when I was studying fire, that, that song connected itself uh, to the topic at hand. We have had two sessions already out of four. This is number three. Uh, some of you are just visiting new uh, and uh, if you want to catch the other ones, you can go to the Sierra Vista SDA Church website uh, and find them uh, archived there. I think the first one was in August. The second one was in October. This is number three. And in two weeks, we'll have number four uh, and finish the series. So one of the things, if you weren't here before, or review for those of you who were, the first of the four parts, the main takeaway point we got from it is that the fire that consumes and destroys in scripture is eternal because God's glorious presence is eternal. It comes out from his presence. He doesn't go away. His glory doesn't go away. And so when Jesus says they will be burned with everlasting fire, he doesn't necessarily mean they will be burning. He means the fire is everlasting. It's everlasting because God's everlasting. His glory doesn't go away. That fire in his presence doesn't go away. Now we'll see today that when the fire flashes out, that part that flashes out does burn up and go out. But the fire it came from never does. It doesn't go out. And that explains why Jesus said they, that the wicked would be burned with everlasting fire. I shared with you earlier, that verse used to bother me because as an Adventist preacher, knowing that the wicked don't burn forever, I thought, Jesus, why did you say the fire was everlasting fire? Did you have to? It made my life hard that he said that. Have you ever complained to God about how he did something? Have you figured out with me that that's always a little short-sighted on my part? to complain to God about anything that he has done. He's wiser than we are. And in the end, we always figure out, ultimately, he's wiser than we are. He knew what he was doing even when we didn't know what he was doing. Uh, and from our perspective, it may not make sense, but from his, it does. And so when he said the fire is everlasting, he meant the fire was everlasting. He did not mean that the wicked burn forever. <laughs> That's clarified in other places. Uh, then the second part, we, we saw that the same fire blesses God's people and destroys sinners. Uh, we were referred to the Red Sea from Revelation 15, where there is the sea of glass mingled with fire. Well, is it the sea of glass or is it the lake of fire? And the answer is yes. 
It's both. Now, I, I remember in my language school classes in Korea, you, you'd give an or question, and, and that didn't compute very well for most of them. Is it this or that? And they'll say yes. No, you're supposed to, you know, do you want uh, blueberries or strawberries on your waffles? Yes. <laughs> no, come on, you're supposed to make a choice. And that was a hard concept, the way we phrased that kind of question. Well, when we take that kind of question back to Revelation 15, is it the sea of glass or is it the lake of fire? And it is actually both. And what we saw was that for those who are in harmony with God, it is the sea of glass. And for those who are not in harmony with God, it is the lake of fire. In Revelation 4, in the great throne room scene there, uh, when God's people come into his presence, it's a sea of glass before his throne. Revelation 20, before God's throne, is the lake of fire. And in Revelation 15, it's the sea of glass mixed, mingled with fire. It's mixed together, can't be separated. It's really the same thing for both. Today we're going to look at fire in the sanctuary and then dive into some of the pieces there. Where is fire found in the sanctuary? This is actually a picture from a full-scale tabernacle and courtyard and altar and items that, that came to uh, the Minnesota camp meeting at Maplewood Academy a few years ago. Uh, one of the other pastors, friend of mine, happened to have his priestly garments along. So between sessions of taking people through to see this model of the sanctuary, we got permission to dash in there and get a few pictures of the, the, the sanctuary as it would have looked in the wilderness. So first, as you come in, you see the altar of burnt offering where the animal sacrifices were burnt. That's one place where fire is found. Inside the holy place, there is the lamp stand with the lamps. That's fire again. The censer used with the altar of incense as well as the altar of incense itself uh, both use fire. And then in the most holy place, there's the Shekinah glory of God's presence from which the other fires have come. Uh, and, and that's the source of the sacred fire at the temple. In Revelation, we saw that it, there was a description of Jesus himself with eyes like flames of fire, face shining like the sun, feet like brass burning in a furnace. The references to fire in his own personal appearance there uh, are several, uh, as well as other places where the seven lamps appear in Revelation. Chapter one, he's walking among them in this picture here. Uh, and then in chapter two, also it references them. Uh, and in chapter four, uh, we find fire in the presence of God. Uh, and then in chapter 8, there's the censer comes back again. The censer is being offered with the prayers of the saints. But then it's filled with fire and thrown to the earth and produces destruction. And, and we noticed last time that the fire in the censer is a blessing with God's people goes up with their prayers, the righteousness of Jesus, making our prayers a sweet thing and not just smoke in God's nostrils. But the same fire in the same censer cast to the earth among those who are not in harmony with God, and it brings judgment uh, on the earth. In Revelation 15, verse 8, it says, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Nobody can go in because the glory of God's presence was so intense. And that happened at the uh, inauguration of the sanctuary in the wilderness. I believe again at Solomon's inauguration of the temple. That, that when, when, when God's glory really gets going... In, in the temple, it can be intense enough that nobody, nobody goes in there. 
And in Revelation 15, it's the, the prelude to the seven last plagues, which come in chapter 16. The temple is filled with the glory of God and smoke from the glory of God. No one could enter it until the plagues were done. That glory is intense. Everyone, even in the heavenly temple, is driven out by that glory. There have been times when that glory, that fire, has flashed forth from God's presence. And we find uh, that God uses fire as a judgment often. In Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah, fire and brimstone fell from heaven from God and burned up Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and, and we were noticing way back in the first session that when you look at fire in scripture, there are several concepts that often come up in the context where fire is mentioned. One of them is God's own presence. And the second most common one is fire as a judgment. And here with uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, both of those themes come together in the same place here. God's presence and the fire that destroys. Uh, is so the fire at Sodom and Gomorrah still burning? Now, in, in Jude, it says that was an example of everlasting fire. Is it still burning at Sodom and Gomorrah? No. Uh, I'm, I've been to the valley there and looked, and you can't see a burning anywhere. In some ways, it would be nice if it was, because then we would know where Sodom and Gomorrah were. We don't actually know exactly where they were, just in that valley somewhere near there along the Jordan Valley near the Dead Sea. And, and so it would simplify life for the archeologists if it was still burning. It is not. It is everlasting fire, but it's not still burning. Because the fire that flashes out burns up and goes out. The results are everlasting. And the fire from which it came is everlasting, but the part that flashes out does not burn forever. That's the part that does the work of judgment. And the work of judgment does not go on forever. Nadab and Abihu, who offered strange fire, not the holy fire. And, and, and as I said at the time, we looked at this once before. I cannot see the difference. Looking at a flame of common fire and a flame of holy fire. I can't see the difference. And apparently Nadab and Abihu had had a little liquor and not only could they not see the difference, it didn't seem to make any difference to them. <laughs> they, 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 they couldn't, they couldn't stick with the concept that it's important to use only the sacred fire. Uh, and uh, fire from the sanctuary came out and, and destroyed them. We also saw the 250 princes who offered the censers when they were not authorized to do that. Uh, they were consumed by the fire that came out from God's presence. Now, all of those are pretty clear signs of judgment from God and God's disapproval. But when the fire flashes out, it's not always disapproval. Sometimes it's approval. Uh, when David, uh, well, it, it started out as disapproval because there was a plague going in Israel because David did exactly what God told him not to do. God said, do not number all the people. Now they did when they came out of Egypt and they did just before they went into Canaan, they numbered the whole congregation. But after that, God said, don't number all the people. Why? Well, if you number all the people, you know what you got for taxation, but primarily military. How many guys do I have for my army? And God says, no, no, don't be counting all your guys for your army. Why? Well, because your real safety is not the army. It's not the army. You go counting all your army and you'll be thinking, <laughs> no, your Dependence is supposed to be not on the number in your army, but on the God of heaven who promises to care for you 
and protect you. And there's been a lot of places in the Old Testament where God did amazing things to deliver his people from vastly outnumbering hosts of, of enemies. It's not the number, but so uh, God says, what do you want? Uh, I'll let you pick your punishment. Uh, and, and he picked the three days of, of plague. Uh, and at the end, as the angel was nearing Jerusalem, and you can kind of see the angel in the sky in the background there in, the, in this painting, uh, holding out his sword over Jerusalem, but he was holding there. And David hurried to offer a sacrifice uh, of repentance for what he had done. And the angel was hovering over the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. See, Jerusalem used to be the city of Jebus. This is one of the not Israelite remaining citizens of old Jebus before David took it over as his capital city. Uh, and on the spot, David strikes a deal to buy that threshing floor and the oxen treading out the grain and all the wooden implements. And he offers the oxen as the sacrifice and he uses the wood to, to uh, make the fire and offers a sacrifice and the angel stopped without destroying in Jerusalem. God sent fire to consume that sacrifice. David didn't light the fire. God sent the fire. And it was a sign that he accepted the sacrifice and was going to stop the plague there. That was divine approval, right? But do you see some similarities between that and the fire that flashes out in judgment? Another place is when the sanctuary in the wilderness was inaugurated and they offered a sacrifice. The fire came out from the sanctuary and ignited on the altar and burned up the sacrifice that they had brought. That happened again uh, when the temple was inaugurated in, in Solomon's day. Second Chronicles 7.1 tells us the fire came out from the temple uh, and consumed the sacrifice. Again, divine approval, acceptance of the offering, sacrifice that has been offered. On Mount Carmel, Elijah offers the sacrifice after the prophets of Baal tried to get fire from heaven without success. Uh, <laughs> Elijah pours the water on it. I mean, they're a desert country, but they had some water in jars around. It's a long time since it rained, but they had some water in jars. They poured 12 of them on there, poured water all over it, uh, saturated it, filled the trench around, and the fire burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones of the altar, the water in the ditch, and the Bible says it's starting to burn the dust of the earth, the ground that you're standing on. Don't know about you, but at that moment, I'm pretty sure I'm backing up. Because I'm standing right here on what's burning right there. It didn't stop with the stones. It didn't stop with the water. And that's crazy enough. But it's starting to burn the dirt we're standing on. Time to give it some room. I'm moving back. Fire, when, when, when God is involved, sometimes does unusual things, like burning wood and water, I mean, stones and water. But with Moses at the burning bush, it did the opposite. Here's a bush. It should have been and gone. Just kept burning, and it wasn't being consumed. Kept on burning and wasn't being consumed. That's what got Moses' attention. That's why he went over there. It wasn't being burned up. It's just a bush. How can it not be burned up? Because God's fire doesn't always do what we think fire does. Divine approval again here. Elijah said, let them see. I did all this at your bidding. This wasn't my idea. I'm, I'm just doing what you told me to do. Uh, make that clear. And, and God made it very clear. Uh, it was a sign of divine approval. We'll go back to uh, Genesis. In the course of time, Cain and Abel brought sacrifices to the Lord. 
We read in Hebrews 11.4 that Abel offered a better sacrifice by faith. By faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain. What was missing in Cain's sacrifice? No faith. No lamb. It was, look what I have done. Here's the produce I will give you. I think it must have been very good produce. One of Cain's cucumbers. We've never had one that good in any of our lifetimes on this earth. That was back just outside the gates of Canaan, of, of, of Eden. That, that was good stuff he brought. It wasn't that there was a problem with what he brought. There was a problem with what he didn't bring and what he didn't have. He didn't have a lamb and he wasn't showing faith. Cain was angry that his sacrifice was not accepted. Abel's was accepted, a sign of God's approval. He sent the fire to consume the sacrifice. But not Cain's, not Cain's. The sacrifices which God has accepted and there's his approval on it. The, uh, the acceptance shows when the fire flashes out and consumes it and it comes from the same fire where the judgment fire comes from. The glory of God's presence in the tabernacle in the temple. Same place, the fire comes out, and, and in one case, it's a judgment and disapproval. In the other case, it's an acceptance. Except when you hang around the topic of fire in scripture for a while, and it percolates down in, there was the day it dawned on me, oh, those two are actually the same thing. Same thing. Not just similar, they're the same thing. What is it that makes it the same? God sent out the fire. He established the sacrificial system. He, he sends the fire that lights the first sacrifice. You keep it going. But look at the question, what does the fire consume when it flashes out? Well, Sodom and Gomorrah, what did it consume? A wicked city, sin, Sinners. When Nadab and Abihu sinned, what was consumed? Nadab and Abihu, they were disobedient. disobedient. They were sinning right then. They are sinners. How about the 250 princes that offered the incense? They were being disobedient. They were sinning at the moment and the fire consumed the sinner. That fire that flashes out always consumes the sin or sinner or the substitute for the sinner. That's the lambs. That's the lambs. The lambs that are being consumed are also a sign, a symbol of the sinner who is out of harmony with God and deserves to die. But instead of us, it's Jesus, our substitute. The lamb, the substitute, takes our place in the fire. That really was the fire that belonged to us, you know. We're all sinners. And that's the end of sinners, is fire. That's how the world will be cleansed when Jesus comes. So every offering on the altar of burnt offering is actually saying, we can come to God, but we can only do it through Jesus. What happens if we come to God without coming through Jesus? And we get into his glorious presence and we're a sinner because we are all sinners. And we have come without a substitute. What happens to us? What happens to a mosquito who goes into one of those little zappers? <laughs> That's what happens to sinners in the presence of God's glory. If we come 
without a substitute. We can't just go in there on our own. Now, Cain was angry that God did not send the fire to consume his sacrifice. But Cain did not offer a lamb, a substitute. What would have happened if God had sent the fire he wanted? It would have consumed sin, sinner. It always does. You check it out in scripture, it always, when it flashes out, it always consumes the sin or sinner or the substitute. And there is no substitute. Who's the sinner? It's Cain. If God sends the fire, what happens to Cain? It was an act of mercy that God didn't listen to Cain and his whining and his pouting and his yelling and his screaming or whatever it was he did. His anger, and God loved him enough not to do it. Anyway, ooh, might have been a touch tempting when you know what's coming next, right? <laughs> Let's save Abel. Let's just give Cain what he's asking for. <laughs> no, God wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. He loved Cain enough not to give him what he asked for because he was the sinner without a substitute and he would have been consumed if God had sent the fire. Back to the sanctuary. Several places the psalmists talk about the end of the wicked in the sanctuary. Uh, particularly Psalm 73. Uh, the, the psalmist there is Asaph and he, he's complaining that the wicked around are doing just fine. Here I am following God's will and life is tough. And I see these other guys, they don't give a lick about what God wants. They just do their thing and they live happily all, all their life. And they go down to the grave happy as all get and they're wealthy and everything is prosperous. And he says, it kind of was getting to me. Loose translation. Until I went to the sanctuary and I saw their end. I was like, whoa! I'm a lot better off with my troubles following God than all the prosperity of the wicked because he saw their end in the sanctuary. And then there was a day I said, where did he see the end of the wicked in the sanctuary? And I walked through the sanctuary in my mind and I wasn't finding it. So let's start in the most holy place. The Ark of the Covenant is there. Inside it has the Ten Commandments, a reflection of God's character. Uh, and over the uh, judgment seat, the Shekinah glory of God's presence. There's fire there. Is that the end of the wicked? I'm not seeing it there in the symbols. It's, it's God's presence. We go out to the holy place, the lamps. Well, Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. It represents Jesus. The oil, the Holy Spirit, Zechariah chapter 4, dripping into the tubes that feed the lamp. The bread, that's Jesus. I'm the bread of life. The altar of incense, the righteousness of Jesus rising with the prayers of the saints. It's not the end of the wicked here. The incense, well, it's Jesus' righteousness, our, our prayers mediated by the Holy Spirit. But again, this isn't the end of the wicked. The labor, that's the washing of regeneration. The altar of burnt offering, Jesus, sacrificed for our sins. Just wasn't seeing it. Wasn't getting it. Where is the end of the wicked in the sanctuary? Well, take another look at that fire right there. Our, our scripture reading this morning was a little odd, wasn't it, Deborah? <laughs> it's about the burnt offering. And only one verse talks about the burnt offering. And then it starts talking about the fire. Don't let the fire go out. And it ends with, don't let the fire go out. And in between it says, Put on your priestly garments and take the ashes off the altar. Pile them by the altar and then go change your clothes. And I, I'd say into your grubs, your work clothes. And haul that out of the camp to a clean place and dump the ashes there. It spends more time talking about the fire and the ashes than it does about the burnt offering. Why? Why? And, and where is he supposed to put the ashes when he takes them off the altar? 
That's the second step. That's after he takes off his priestly garments. Then he hauls it out. When he's taking it off the altar, he has a stopping point for it. Right beside the altar. On the east side, it says. Leviticus, I think it's chapter 1 or 2. It says, on the east side of the altar, there's an ash pile. Which side of the sanctuary is the gate? The east side. If this is between the altar, it's on the east side of the altar, it's between the altar and the gate. It's the first thing you see when you walk in. Have you ever seen that in a sanctuary model? I have never. Have you ever seen it in a sanctuary picture? I have never seen it. The first thing you come to is an ash pile. It's what's left of what was burned on the altar of burnt offering is what? Ashes. Ashes. The fire is a continuous fire on that altar. And there are places that talk about that, that morning and evening sacrifice being a continual sacrifice. Always there. Never not there. It's continual. It, it doesn't stop. And the fire doesn't stop but that continual fire destroys to what ashes. to ashes to ashes now jesus is our substitute represented by the lamb what happens to the lamb on the altar of burnt offering consumed to ashes. Now, we're going to dig back into that a little more next time. Um, the, 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 the sanctuary in the wilderness was God's house, but it was also a place of worship. God says, I want you guys to make a tent for me so I can live with you, be with you. He used to come visit Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden every day in the cool of the day. He says, I want to be with you guys. And, and God finally does get to live with us in Revelation when the city comes down and it says, God himself will be with them and be their God. I will be with you, says God. He wants to be with us. And so he says, build me a tent so I can be with you guys. And, and in Bedouin camps of the day, you knew who the chief was by glancing around and finding the biggest, best tent. That's his. That's the boss. That's his tent. So when you walk into the Israelite camp, if you were a Bedouin who lived out there in the desert tending your sheep, and you went into their camp, you'd know where the boss's tent is. And it's not Moses. It's the one right in the middle. And it's significantly bigger and better than all the other tents. And that's God's tent where he stays with us. But we also see in scripture that it talks about Jesus has gone into the heavenly temple. And it says he entered in through the veil, that is through his flesh. He's gone to heaven into the heavenly temple. And, and the things in the courtyard are things that happened on the earth. Jesus' death, the altar of burnt offering, that happened on this earth. The labor, his baptism, that happened on this earth. But the provision for our spiritual food and light and our prayers, that happens in heaven. So the stuff in the sanctuary is heavenly stuff. And the stuff on this earth was the related earthly experiences. And where is the labor? Well, it's in the courtyard. Right? It's in the courtyard. And where... Uh, is that sea of glass uh, in Revelation 15? It's in front of the throne. It's in front of the throne. Uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an earthly fulfillment for it. And, and one of the parts of that sea of glass mingled with fire is the fire. When the fire consumes the wicked, where will it happen? In heaven or on this earth? Here. On this earth. It's a courtyard event when it's the fire. It's a courtyard event when it's the fire. Hmm, I think I jumped too. Yeah, 
sorry. Um, the altar equals the lake of fire, the destruction of evil, the end of all sin and sinners. It's a continual eternal fire, but it reduces to ashes. Uh, Second Thessalonians 1, 7 to 9 talks about the wicked being destroyed by the brightness of his coming. It also talks about they are destroyed with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. Forever out of God's presence is the ultimate penalty for sinners. You're gone. Uh, and ashes is what they will become. Malachi says there'll be ashes under the sole of your feet. The ashes and fire together theme are, are pointing us to the fact that the wicked do indeed burn up. Although the fire comes from eternal fire, they become ashes. They become ashes. And that's the end for them. So where did the a psalmist see the end of the wicked in the sanctuary? Well, the altar of burnt offering, the fire. In, in Psalm 37, he talks about the smoke going up. That's how the wicked are going to be. Their smoke is going to go up. It, it's the fire, it's the smoke, it's the ashes, all connected with the altar of burnt offering. That's where the psalmist saw the end of the wicked. That's how the wicked end in scripture. It's with fire. Um, so anytime a sinner comes into contact with the fire of God's glorious presence, we will be burned up. Boy, I think this was back in the 80s. And there's a few of you who remember the 80s. Some of you don't. <laughs> but for those of you who remember the 80s, you might have heard a song by the Oak Ridge Boys talking about God meeting people coming to heaven and saying, Come on in. You've done the best that you could do. There's a little bit of good in all of us. There's a little bit of me and you. Just come on in. From what we just studied, what happens if us good old boys just come on in the way we are, into God's presence? It doesn't work. Now, that's not because we're not nice people. We might be very nice neighbors. And God loves us a lot. He loves us enough to send his son to die for us. That's a lot. But that doesn't prevent the fact that we are sinners and when we waltz into God's presence, we incinerate. That's just the way it is. Unless, unless we come with a substitute. It's the only way we can come into God's presence. With a substitute. Cain didn't get that, but Abel did. And we need to. Yes. It doesn't matter how much we are a good old boy. We can't just come on in. We have to come through Jesus or it cannot work. So when the fire flashes out from God's presence, either in approval or disapproval, it always consumes sin or sinner or the substitute. And the Bible says... He made him, that is, God made Jesus to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God through him. So what's going to be consumed by the fire that finally flashes out and cleanses this earth from sin? It will be sin, sinners. That will be either us or the substitute, Jesus. Jesus. So, Point three, when the fire of God's glory flashes forth, either in approval or disapproval, that fire always consumes sin, sinner, either us or Jesus. Which means we cannot come to God apart from Jesus or we will be consumed. A couple questions remaining. I posed some questions at the beginning of this series that I had rattling around in my head that found nice answers when I was studying fire in scripture. Why did Jesus have to say it was everlasting fire? Because it's everlasting fire. 
Because God is everlasting. It comes from his glory. He was his temple telling us the truth. Why would he not tell us a truth? Why would he not? Uh, and uh, a couple more questions are still left dangling. Why did God specify that the Passover lamb must be roasted with fire? Cannot boil it. Can't do anything with it other than roast it with fire. Don't break a bone either. Don't break a bone. And what does this, the lamb have to do with the song of Moses? Revelation 15, 3, at the sea of glass mingled with fire, the victors, God's people, standing on this sea, to them sea of glass, sing the song of Moses and the lamb. Well, the song of Moses was a song of victory when the sea, Red Sea, in Moses' case, when the sea closed on their enemies and delivered God's people from their pursuers. The same sea blessed God's people with deliverance and destroyed their enemies. The same sea in the end, the lake of fire, will be a blessing to God's people to be in God's presence and a destruction to the wicked because to them it is a judgment. It is fire that consumes but what does the lamb have to do with the song of Moses? Next time. Lord, thank you for reminding us that we don't have anything to recommend us to you, but that you have made the way for us to come back into your presence from which we have been separated by sin. May the day be soon where we can rejoice in your presence like calves on a spring morning. In Jesus' name, amen.